Morning guys, afternoon even. It's ten past twelve on a Monday lunchtime. It can only be the Big Idea Podcast and it's episode ten today. Episode ten. And I'm back. That's what I'm gonna hey. say. <laughs> <laughs> Waiting for the cheers, you know, where's my crowd? <laughs> Slow hand clap. Oh, thanks very much. Cool. So yes, you yeah, had uh, fun last week. We did, it was good. Yeah, it was really good. Uh, Rob was brilliant. He was, he was enigmatic, he was inspirational. He was here. <laughs> he was. That's good. It was. It was an interesting episode. Um, obviously, uh, I can talk about marketing all day long till the cows come home, and we pretty much did. I think it was fifty-two minutes hmm. last week. So we're going to try and be on point today and do a nice thirty-ish minutes. Which, having seen the script, it's going to be tough. Because <laughs> I, I, you know, I thought, fear. Yeah, yeah. We know a little bit about that. We'll write a few pages on the on the old script. And I think as we asked in the group um, last week, we started getting lots of comments from mm. people, lots of different fears, lots of things. Everyone's got these little niggles that keep them awake at night. And uh, yeah, I think actually there's lots of different things to cover in this. Fear is a huge, huge topic, isn't it? It is, yeah, absolutely. So, it's, uh, yeah, it doesn't matter what it is, it, whether it's jumping out of a plane or whether it's going to speak at a public event, it's, it's tricky for whoever, you know, it's something out of your comfort zone. Mm. Good. So with that, giving you too much away. <laughs> no, it's like giving too much of our content away. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as always, guys, if you've got any comments, leave them in the thread. Um, today we're just doing something a little bit different. We're not actually watching live, so do leave comments in here though. And once we finish recording the audio, we will come back and we will answer any questions that you've left during live recording. So please, yeah, if you've got any questions, do leave them in here. Um, if we don't pick them up during the live recording or you know, just after this, this live podcast, uh, we will pick them up throughout the week and hopefully we can help uh, allay your fears. Mm. Okay, so shall we crack on with episode 10? All in favour, say aye. <laughs> um, let's do that, John. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> hey guys, welcome along to the Big Idea Podcast. I'm John, as here as always. Uh, apart from last week, I'm joined by Mr. Jason Brockman. Morning, Jason. How are you? I'm very well, John. Thank you. And welcome, everybody. Good, good. It's good to see you back. Oh, it's good to be back. Yeah. We enjoyed uh, Rob Rowe last week, didn't we? I, I certainly listened to it and uh, thought it was really good. He was. <laughs> he was able to do the dissection while you were doing the marketing. It was fab. He was, yeah. I never knew he was qualified to do dissection, but apparently so. <laughs> <laughs> so, it is our job here at the Big Idea Podcast to help small businesses think bigger. And... That's really, really relevant today because we are talking about conquering fears today and fear is, is all about thinking and it's about controlling your thinking. So one of the things we did in preparation for this episode was we took a quick straw poll. Straw poll? It's like a straw, straw poll. poll? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we took a quick straw poll in our Facebook community uh, which is bigidea.co.uk forward slash Facebook. And we asked the guys and girls in there to tell us that some of their most common fears, um, and it was a, there were a wide range of different fears and things that keep people awake at night, weren't there? There absolutely was, yes. Yeah. Some to do with business and some not to. We had fears about public speaking, getting up and talking in front of groups of people. We had fears of picking up the phone, just getting to call people and uh, ask them for the sale and, and talk to people. Um, it could be anybody. And um, we had closing a sale, difficulty with doing that. So it's really easy to say, oh, my product's fantastic, but it's really hard for some people to say, but do you want to buy it now? Um, there's, there's a difficulty. Uh, we had hiring staff and sacking yeah. staff. There was we two, did quite two, two fears. There's a lot of staff ones, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, doing the accounts, very poignant for us in the UK with our tax returns due tomorrow. It's tomorrow, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, due tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, so there's a. Or, there's or a if you're fear. listening to the podcast on the day it comes out on Wednesday, yesterday. <laughs> and you've got a £100 fine coming at you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that's great. And we had dealing with technology because there's lots of people in business that perhaps didn't grow up with technology. And so all the latest movements in things like CRMs and databases and email marketing and things weren't really something that you were comfortable with. So people were, were fearful of that. Uh, running out of money. Yeah, there's quite a few money-related ones, weren't there? Mm -hmm. um, and it is, again, it's one of those things that you know, keeps lots of people awake at night, is fear of not having money, or physically not having money. 
Um, and in many cases, it's the fear of not having money, which is actually more likely um, to keep you awake at night. Mm -hmm. And there were those that were fearful of clowns. Yep. And also cats, cat pictures. Yes. <laughs> yes we do see a cat picture. Uh, somebody afraid of that one as well. So. Yeah. <laughs> but we are only born with two built-in fears. So that is the fear of falling and fear of loud noises. So every other thing that you're afraid of is learned, it's conditioned, and it's conditioned by your comfort zone. Or more specifically, I think by only doing things that are well within your comfort zone. And There's lots of people that have point, points on that though, isn't there? Because obviously as you grow up, as a child, you've got no fears. Most children will do anything at all, yeah. climb trees without worrying about how high they are, you know, do all sorts of things like that, isn't it? But it's as you kind of get older, you kind of say, no, don't do that because it's dangerous, and don't Careful. do this because you do that. Careful now. Yeah. Stop. Careful. Oh, you won't fall. <laughs> Careful, that's hot. You know, it's it, literally, you are conditioned through a lifetime of don't do that, be careful, stop, slow down, don't run. Signs everywhere, you know, telling you what could happen to think that everything's dangerous. Um, but and without growing that comfort zone, because I always think of it, your comfort zone is the same size as your success zone, which sounds really American and spammy, I'm very sorry about that. But the bigger your comfort zone is, the more success you're gonna have. The smaller you keep your comfort zone, the more you limit your success. Now, I, I used to have a mentor, he used to talk to me about comfort zones and all sorts of things. He said, the way to grow your comfort zone is to think of it like a hula hoop. And you imagine this, you've got a small hula hoop, just about fits you know, around you, lay it on the ground, he said, literally, that is your comfort zone. If you step just outside of that comfort zone, then that hula hoop becomes a little bit bigger. And that is the key to growing your comfort zones, by doing stuff that's just a little bit out of reach, just a little, you know, it's no good saying, well, actually, I'm really timid and I'm really shy, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to step on stage in front of 3,000 people. Because that's just ridiculously outside of your comfort zone. But actually saying, I'm really shy, I'm really timid, I'm going to talk to one person today. That is a little bit outside your comfort zone. You can do that. And as you do that, that hula hoop gets a little bit bigger. And then a little bit bigger. But only when you do things that are just outside of it. So you were explaining that to me a little bit earlier with in regards to uh, fitness, weren't you? Um, yeah. And uh, you said to me about press ups, and I said, oh, no, I'm not one for for press ups. Yeah. And you said to me, uh, commit to one. You can do one. You can do you? one. Could you do one press up? And it's like, well, I probably could do one press up. And uh, he said, we'll do that every day. He said, if we do one press up every day, then that one will grow slightly and turn yeah. into two. Because yeah, eventually one will be, oh, this is just so easy. Of course I can do two. And then, oh, I'll connect to two. And then eventually, 10 becomes easy. Mm -hmm. But if you were to say, right, I'm going to do 10 every night, first night, you'd be purple in the face. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have got to 10. <laughs> <laughs> but it is, it's about doing that. It actually comes to the same growth, isn't yeah, it? Because you because, do one and now you're more comfortable with that one, you can grow again by doing another yeah, one and, and so on. Because yeah. look at your initial reaction was, no, I don't do press -ups. I don't really do that. I don't Can't do, do running press -ups. either. Running's not my thing. Because yeah. <laughs> that's your comfort zone. Yeah, yeah. You know, not doing press-ups, not running, that's inside your comfort zone. Saying I'm gonna do one press-up, what that is. All right, it's, it's a millimeter outside of your comfort zone. Now when it comes to pushing your comfort zone, you kind of pushed your comfort zone a little bit further than that, didn't you? Um, I've done lots of things to, to kind of push. I'm just thinking push. one rather 15,000 times big <laughs> comfort zone. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I always say that there's a ripple effect. So the more you do stuff, outside your comfort zone in your personal life, then the bigger your comfort zone is going to get in your business life. And vice versa, the more you do stuff in business that grows your comfort zone, it will transfer to your private life. So I now do stuff in my personal life to stretch my comfort zone. And one of the things that I did last year was a 15,000 foot skydive. It was, it was a tandem skydive. So, you know, it wasn't me on my own just you know, strapping a parachute to my back and jumping out of an aeroplane. So you still had a little bit of comfort. Yeah, there was. <laughs> Even if it's um, 15,000. Well, there wasn't, there wasn't, because I was, I was thinking about this on the way home after I'd done the, the skydive. And for anyone who hasn't done a skydive, I really, really would recommend it because it was just the best feeling in the world. But I remember coming home and realising that I had completely 
put my life in someone else's hands. Because I'd got on an aeroplane and I'd strapped myself to a bloke who I'd met an hour before, who I didn't even ask him if he had a parachute on his back, if he'd checked that it was packed correctly, if he knew what he was doing, if he'd even done this before. <laughs> I just trusted that, yeah, this guy knows what he's Did doing. That's his name? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, for me, you know, if I'd analysed that during the day, I could have talked myself out of doing that because, oh, my God, you know, what if something goes wrong? Um, I mean, <laughs> we were there with um, my brother-in-law, who's done a lot of solo skydives now, um, my wife and their parents. And it was, a, as Mark described to me, it was a typical skydiver's day, whereby it was really bloody cloudy and we just sat on the ground in the cafe waiting for permission for the plane to actually take off in the first place. And that was the scariest part, was that anticipation of, oh my God, is it going to happen? Is it going to happen? But I remember that at one point, Sarah was offered the chance to go up in the plane with me. So she didn't want to do the skydive, but she was able to go up in the plane with me and push. she would... No? <laughs> I think she has to do a charge extra for that push. But she was able to sit in the cockpit and then after all the jumpers had actually jumped out, they do a, I think it's a... 10,000 foot free fall in the plane. So literally, just they kill the engines and just vroom, they just dive. So it's a, a simulated dive, they call it, but you know, basically the pilot controls it. And she said to her mum, oh, I'm going to do this. And her mum is a bit of a worry, a bit of a panic. It's, oh, don't know about that. Okay, she accepted that she was able to do that. Now, Sarah was hoping to come on my aeroplane, watch me jump out and then do this dive. She wasn't able to, she had to get back for the children. Oh, she was going out that evening, so she had to come back because I was on like plane number five. So she was able to go on the aeroplane with her brother, at which point she announced to her parents, oh, Mark and I, so your two children are going to be on the same aeroplane. Mark's going to jump out, I'm going to do so. No, 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 you can't do that. No, 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 you're not going together. It's like, oh, so you don't mind if one of us dies? As long as it's not both of us together. But, you know, she just instantly saw the fear of my two children are both going to die because they're on this aeroplane. At least Mark had a parachute. Well, exactly. <laughs> I mean, I, I would say that tandem for me wasn't that scary because the bit that was scared, that would have been really scary for me that I don't know if I would have been able to do is at 15,000 foot, someone opening the door and saying, right, walk over there and jump out. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a choice. It was like, you're on your knees, there's a guy, pretty hefty, strapped to your back, and he literally pushes you to the door. You, he holds onto the rail, you're not holding onto it, you're literally crossed your arms, head back, legs back, and you are just literally, right, on the count of three, we're gonna go, and I think he probably went on two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and looking back at that video now, my face just goes from like pure terror. Oh my God, what the hell am I doing? I'm just looking at, you know, literally, someone, I've never been on an aeroplane before where someone's opened the door. <laughs> and, yeah. and I mean, that, that was probably the scariest point was the anticipation. Because once you take off, you're past that point of no return. They tell you that. They say, look, if you get on this aeroplane, is it on the understanding you will not land on the aeroplane? We, there is no backing out. It's stuff's getting very real mm -hmm. from this point on. You sit on this aeroplane, and I've never sat on an aeroplane backwards before so you're facing the tail of the aeroplane on a bench um, there was no pre-flight checks there was no stewardess with a trolley <laughs> um, you know no seat belts nothing you just sit there um, yeah I mean thankfully if something happened at least we've got a parachute but you just sit there look at the tail end of the airplane and then all of a sudden you're seeing the tail end has got duct tape all over the place like oh my god it's held together with duct tape and I'm sat right by the door, and the door is kind of made of this Perspex stuff. It just lifts up. So as you take off, you can just see the ground getting further and further and further away. And I remember just... The breath was just not coming. And you get to about, I got to about 5,000 feet, I think. And I didn't know how high this was. I'm just looking at the window, and I'm seeing yeah, we're above the clouds now. It's a long way down there. And I remember saying to him, right... You know, we're, we're ready to jump in a minute. And he looked at his altimeter on his watch. He said, oh yeah, you've got another 10,000 feet to go. Yeah, I'm like, oh. 
he said, he said to me, this is the point at which we'll open the parachute. I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> but yeah, once you take off, you're past that point of no return. It's just completely... I mean, everything's scary until you've done it. And it was that anticipation of, oh my God, oh my God, I'm going to have to do this. I think I was like second... Yeah, second... Well, I was the first of the amateurs out. So they'd, they'd been a professional solo jumper who'd gone out first, and then our cameraman had just gone out in front of us. So I was the first amateur to go out, the first tandem skydiver to go out. Which was good, because I, I always like to go first now, and I think I'll come to that later in this episode, but if I'd had to sit there and watch seven, eight, nine people go out, I'm like, that's me in a minute, that's me, it's four until it's me, it's three until it's me, oh my God, I've got to go in two. It was just literally, boom, you know, literally they opened the door, this green light came on, and then the first one just went. And I just remember this noise because he went out and then just whoop, and went sideways. I'm like, where did that bloke just go? He was <laughs> sat next to me in the plane and now all of a sudden he's half a mile away yeah. because we're travelling at 90 miles an hour in one direction. He then dives off in the other direction. But for me, that, you know, that's, that was scary. If I was to do it again, it wouldn't be scary because I think everything's scary until you've done it once. Mm -hmm. You know, if I was to do it again, yeah, I may still get that may still get the adrenaline flowing, but you know, if that first jump, the fear level was like nine out of 10 or 10 out of 10. Mm -hmm. Well, next time it'll be a four out of 10 or five out of 10, because I know what to expect. It's a mild apprehension rather than yeah. yeah. Next time it'll be, oh, I wonder if it's going to be like that was that. Oh, really loud. I wonder if it's going to, yeah, I'm going to be anticipating what's going to happen. And yeah, it's still going to be that initial, oh my God, I've got to go over the threshold. And that is, is that little threshold that's the scary bit. And once you push yourself over that, if you look at the video of my, <laughs> I didn't say my face just goes, from, oh my god, oh my god, I don't want to do this, and then literally like five ten seconds later, there's just absolute delight, sheer joy on my face of, oh my god, this is the best feeling in the world, oh my god, I'm flying, you know, it's just literally that border between, I don't want to do this, you know, if they'd said to me there, John, we've got this little upsell for a hundred quid. You can not jump, you can get back, sit in your seat and we'll land the aeroplane. I think I'd have been very tempted <laughs> with that. But just the minute I crossed that border from, oh, I don't want to do this, to I've done it. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, this is actually really good. I'm really loving this. Um, so now getting over that border outside of that hula hoop is a little bit easier. And I think if uh, enough people on our Facebook group want to see it, we'll pop that video up, shall we? Yeah, yeah, we can. Let's put that video up, we'll pop it on our YouTube channel. <laughs> Um, yeah, we'll talk about all that at the end of our podcast. That sounds good, yeah. If we get 500 likes on this comment, <laughs> this video, we will show, yeah. No, no, we'll put it up on the, on the community. That'd be good to see. Yeah, bigidea.co.uk forward slash Facebook. Um, but I know I, it's tough because I, what we try and do with fear is we try and use logic to beat it, particularly men, because men are logical creatures. Sorry, women, but, but we are. And they, they kind of did that in the briefing for the, the skydive. And, you know, they said, look, Anyone, anyone worried about this? Anyone a little bit nervous about this? You know, a few hands went up. And the instructor said, okay, has anybody driven here today? And of course, everyone's done that. And he said, oh, good. He said, oh, well, you've all done the most dangerous bit. <laughs> and yes, it kind of, it, it did, you know, kill the ice. It, you know, relaxed the tension and the rim a little bit. But yeah, logically, if you look at the statistics, driving a car is more dangerous than jumping out of an airplane with a parachute because more people die on the roads every single day than do jumping out of an airplane. Mm -hmm. But the problem with that is fear just isn't logical, it's automatic, it's primeval. So whilst we know this, you know, this is safer than driving a car, I can still get in a car without getting scared. But that's your comfort zone because you're doing it every single yeah. day. So that's, that explains that a little bit. When you first got in the car and went, yeah. oh, I've got to drive this, <laughs> there's your apprehension, there's your fear. It was. Yeah. yeah, like the first driving lesson was, oh my God, you know, I'm moving and I'm doing 10 miles an hour and oh my God, there's a pedestrian there and there's another car there. And oh, what the... Rob, the, Rob, our producer, was learning to drive them and he's got a little chuckle on his face at the moment because <laughs> this is what he's going through. You know, he's had 25 lessons and he's still at that level. <laughs> when he's gripping the steering wheel. <laughs> I always remember it of fear actually because uh, when I was at a, a team kind of thing, we went into a car with the friends, uh, four of us in a car, and um, I wasn't driving, I was in the back. And uh, we went down a, a hill, we aquaplaned and did a spin and landed up in our roof. 
in a, in a ditch and uh, the four of us walked out with the, without even a cut which was which was miraculous but it did take me an awful long time to get back into a car um, after that experience because it was kind of like oh, there's a fear there's, <laughs> there's something that I've had you know happened to me that sort of thing but again you get into it and now you, it's, you know it's fine again but uh, yeah that was a kind of a, a big fear for me then. It is but again that, that's um, I mean I've said all we can do that to to change what powers the fears because we're only built with these two falling and loud noises, everything else that powers our fears is our experiences, our beliefs and our environment. So experiences, you've just got the brilliant one there. Mm-hmm. So you know, you've had an incident in a car, well that affects your fear of driving or your fear of being a passenger in a car, your fear of what happens when it's wet. Mm-hmm. That is completely influenced by your experience. You weren't born with that fear, that's been conditioned by your experience. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, it, it's about like feeling the fear and doing it anyway, so literally stepping off the aeroplane, you know, stepping outside of the hula hoop, and oh, actually everything's okay. Let's push things a little bit further. Um, you know, I used to be, a, I used to be quite shy as a child, as a teenager. I was afraid of speaking to strangers, probably as a result of being constantly told as kids, "Don't talk to strangers." Charlie says, <laughs> um, "If you're no under the, if that. you're under the age of what thirty, <laughs> you have no idea who Charlie and is." And only from the UK. <laughs> YouTube.com, just type in Charlie Says and you will see the public information adverts that we had during the 80s, which were a little boy and his cat. And his cat, for some reason, used to talk and tell him not to take sweets from strangers and not to go and see men with puppies and be careful when crossing the road. Don't play with fireworks. Yeah. And all sorts. <laughs> yeah. Which, yeah, for some reason stays within our, uh, our subconscious. But I mean, yeah, over the last few years, I've I've kind of made an effort, consciously made an effort, to step outside of that hula hoop and go up to speak to people that I didn't know. So for me, one of the main areas I do that at is the gym, or particularly the sauna at the gym. So if I'm at the gym and I go to the sauna afterwards, and there's someone in there, I will just talk to them. You know, young, old, black, white, male, female, rich, poor, you know, whatever. It's like, well, actually, we're all sat in here sweating. We're all bloody hot. You know, there's always something to talk about. See, so, yeah, I'll just open up um, the conversation. And before you know it, yeah, I've made some really good connections in, in that just by literally opening up the conversation and saying, bloody hot in here, isn't it? Or, you know, there's better thing, there's worse things to be doing on a Friday afternoon than chilling out and sort of, oh, yeah, it's great. You know, what do you do? Oh, I do that. You know, literally, we could have sat in silence for 15 minutes and I'd be within my comfort zone. But actually, just sitting there, in silence for maybe 10 seconds and then, oh, yeah, oh, yeah how's it doing? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, and then people just open up. Everyone wants to be friendly, everyone wants to talk to you. Um, so I maybe still feel a little socially awkward. So I'm now pushing that a little bit further by attending more and more sort of proper offline networking groups. You know, I've worked online for like 17 years now, so to actually go out and meet real people and have that initial, again, over the threshold, outside the hula hoop of, what do you do? Ah, ah, well, oh, oh, I do this and I do that. Oh my God, I've got, got to get my elevator pitch sorted now. You know, All that self-talk that goes on in my head that stops me saying, just having a conversation with someone, because that's all it is really, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so yeah, if you're afraid of using the phone, well, force yourself to use the phone every day. I'm not saying, you know, right, pick up the phone and code call that customer, no. Ring a fr- family member, ring a friend, ring a loved one. Just someone who's actually going to be receptive to your call, but just if you normally text them or if you normally send them a Facebook message, well, pick up the phone, call them. Your comfort zone will get that a little bit bigger, but actually using the phone isn't scary. Mm-hmm. Why are we scared of using the phone? You know, is it, is it because we've had a bad experience on the phone? Or is it that we've seen someone else have a bad experience? There's TV programs where people get shouted at, or, you know, mm-hmm. we think that because we get telesales calls in that anyone thinks that if we call them, oh, it's going to be unsolicited, they're going to tell us to piss off. Well, no, I mean, start with friends and family, people you talk to normally, do that for a few weeks, then work it up. Get that comfort zone, get that hula hoop a little bit bigger with some repeat customers, some warm customers, people who already know, like, and trust you. Just let you give them a ring. How's it going? I'm just running for chat. I'm not, wrong, not wrong to sell you anything. I'm just here to make sure you're happy. Oh my god, oh brilliant, let's have a chat with our customers. The telephone is not scary. Don't sell to them. Then step up a little bit at a time until eventually you are comfortable with, or not, you know, you're not comfortable with, 
It's just outside of your comfort zone to pick up the phone and code call someone. Don't go straight to that zone, don't go straight to 10 press ups. Just work your way up until that code call is just outside of your comfort zone, not massively outside. Because otherwise, if you, if you step too far outside, you'll go, oh my God, that was awful. They told me to piss off and using the phone is scary and all of a sudden your comfort zone gets smaller and not bigger. I suppose it, all in all, it's the fear of rejection, <coughs> whether that's the rejection in the sauna, we're talking to the guy there, it's yeah. actually, if he's open a conversation, it's quite embarrassing if they don't want to reciprocate with the conversation. Yeah, oh, I've heard that. So it's that, it's that fear of, of yeah. rejection, really, or you pick up the phone to speak to somebody and they don't really want to talk to you, or they slam the phone down, or they do shout at you down the phone, so it's yeah. that fear of rejection. Going to a networking thing is like, Remember, everybody's there to do the same thing as you've gotten to there to do. So it's to have a conversation. So that's a nice, easy one to be able to get into, really. Oh, I wrote that a couple of months ago about networking events. And perhaps Mike, who's in our Facebook group, might be able to sort of help us out with this. But I, I read something along the lines of, it's about 80%. 80% of people, when surveyed, said that networking was easier for other people than themselves. So everyone, <laughs> everyone finds networking easier than I do. Eighty percent of people, or like eighty-five percent of people, said that. It was like, well, clearly that's not true, is it? You know? <laughs> <laughs> not everyone can think that everyone has it has it worse than them. It's let's say everyone's in the same boat. Everyone's there for the same reason. Um, anyway, one of our other ones was about staff, business. wasn't it? Really? Yeah, we had a lot about staff, and I think we'll probably do a standalone episode on staff because there's a lot of issues with staff, aren't there? We're sat there now looking at a couple of numbers of our staff. <laughs> But it's, it's one of those things that people are afraid of hiring, they're afraid of firing. Now, certainly if you're afraid of firing people, it's, for me, a short-term pay versus long-term pain. Same with the skydive. The worst bit is the anticipation of, oh my God, what's it gonna be like? Oh, how are they gonna react? Are they, are they gonna hit me? Is there gonna be trouble here? Are we gonna have to have security march them off the premises? Do you know, do you know what the worst thing is? It's getting that first sentence out. Mm. Sorry, Rob. We're going to have to let you go. That's an example, yeah. But it, once you've done that, it's a piece of cake from there, isn't it? Mm. Um, and I found that, you know, the first one I did, I remember it was, you know, I'm sorry, we're going to have to let you go. I was like, oh, yeah, I thought you, I thought you would have said that. I thought you would have done it six months ago. It's usually, it's unusual <laughs> that it's a surprise. No, exactly. Yeah. The only time it may well be is if you can't afford them any longer and they hadn't realised there was a problem yeah. with the business. And, and, and that's probably the only surprise element. If it's because of performance, they're already well aware of. Yeah. that they're, they're underperforming and that you know it's on the cards at yeah. some point and uh, or maybe yeah. they're not happy but they haven't got the balls to actually quit because they're afraid yeah. of quitting <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the biggest one though I think most people's number one fear is public speaking isn't it mm -hmm. um, I mean, I've done a few public speaking gigs best men's speeches at weddings but I it's something that I'd like to get a lot better at so I've done a few training courses and everything like that but I'm now pushing myself outside of my comfort zone again. So doing stuff like, oh, I don't know, recording podcasts that the whole world could listen to, doing live Facebook videos where people are actually able to ask questions in real time. People are actually watching that right now. We are recording this live in our Facebook group. So there's a camera pointed at us. Hopefully there are real people watching. Hello, everybody out there. Um, so Again, we may do a, a standalone episode or maybe an in-between episode on public speaking, but quickly, here's, here's just a few tips that I've gone through, which is, first of all, lose the script. And whilst we've got a script here today, we're more referring to that as bullet points, I would say. Um, so it's, it's, it's important to have bullet points. I think I, I do quite a bit of public speaking through um, various things that I'm involved with. and. Uh, and it is important to know where you're going with your conversation, but it's also uh, yeah, important to lose a script. You're not, you're not reading it. It's not a Donald Trump speech. You, you know, you literally, you, you know what you're going to be saying and you kind of have to say it out from the heart, really, yeah. because then people will engage with you as, as a public speaker. Yeah. I mean, yeah, Donald Trump is probably the exception who he needs to have a script because he needs to deliver seven minute sermons, mm -hmm. which need to be carefully worded and written to the word to convey certain points. And obviously, yeah, and it's fed to him in the autoresponder. But for most people, I mean, one of the public speaking courses I went on, we wrote out what we were going to say. And again, we were told, look, just do it in bullet point form. You know, this is, this is I want to convey points A, B, C, D, E, and F. And there's some stories to back it up. There's a, there's a narrative there, but don't have a script. And this one guy obviously tippy-tapped it out on his laptop. 
It was then time to deliver your speech. So he gets up to the front of the room with his laptop and he's, got, he's cradling this laptop and he's talking verbosely from the laptop and, and we kept saying, look up. And he's like, yeah, yeah, and he's, then he's looking up at the audience and he's engaged with the audience and then he's back down in the script again. He's looking at his laptop and he can't make out what his being says. But mate, mate, lose the laptop. No, I, I can't, I can't possibly. He's like, this is your area of expertise. This is your specialist subject. You know this stuff. Mm -hmm. Just have a rough plan of what you're doing and put the laptop down. He's like, oh, I don't know. And eventually the, the trainer came along and he just shut the lid of this laptop. So right, carry on. And just instantly the guy looked up, started breathing, and he was just talking to people and he was just being authentic. And that, I think, is the key thing to public speaking is don't try and be clever. Don't try and be, unless you are Donald Trump or you're Theresa May and you've got a team of script writers working for you, don't try and be clever or perfect. Just be you be the real you um talk to people as well not at them so it's not a sermon mm -hmm. you know make eye contact with people i know that's again scary for a lot of people is to make eye contact so talk to one person in the front row and then talk to a person three along in the second row and you know just literally talk to people um, make them familiar faces you know there's always people that you go to these these these, these things with people who are interested in stuff so if it's people that you know maybe family maybe friends maybe maybe business colleagues maybe somebody that you work with um, you can look at them <laughs> that you're engaging with with the audience you can tell from their face then whether you're doing a good job yeah i mean yeah, who in that audience wants you to fail anyway mm -hmm. probably about five people <laughs> <laughs> not the ones you're looking at no exactly <laughs> Um, but even they will be polite enough, particularly in our country. I mean, Christ, we're British. We don't do heckling. Even, even at a comedy show, I've been to a Jimmy Carr gig when he said, like, come on, heckle me. And there was about 30 seconds where people go, no, I'm fine, you're right. You're I'm right. not going to be first. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's going to laugh at me, I'm not going to do that. He said, come on, I've got some brilliant lines to put down hecklers. I want to practice them. Give me some heckles. And you're like, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> we're British, you know. Um, but yeah, enjoy it. That's the key thing. So don't worry about... All the stuff. I mean, when I when I did my presentation in this course, I immediately after I sat down, I wrote down everything that had gone through my head. Oh my God, I forgot to breathe. Uh, did I stand in the right place? What was I doing with my hands? Where was I looking? Uh, were people paying attention? Were they listening? I, oh, was I talking too fast? Was I talking too slow? Just enjoy the moment. You're going to feel like you're on cloud nine afterwards, but just don't overthink it. Don't overcomplicate it. Just talk to a friend. Mm -hmm. That friend's in the front row. That friend's in the third row. That friend's on the end, glaring at you. Um, so that's environment. Beliefs is the next thing, because in most cases, what's scary isn't the thing itself. It's that anticipation. It's the deciding to decide. It's the self-talk. Um, and that all comes from your beliefs, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I did, uh, in the summer, we did a fundraiser, um, and it was a ab sale just off the side of a little shopping mall. Yeah. And um, we had 30 or 40 people that were coming to do that. And, you know, those that had done it before were up and down, and there was no problems. But, there, you know, probably about uh, about a quarter hadn't done anything like it before, and it was that well outside their comfort zone. And yeah. it was kind of literally, I've got to get to the air, I've got to do that, I've got to get up, I've got to put my harness on, I've got to get up to the top, and then it's a long walk up those stairs. And yeah. then it was kind of like, gets onto the platform and then he kind of roped onto the platform and he's talking to you and all that sort of and then it's kind of well you just need to walk backwards now until you get to the edge don't go over the edge just get to the edge and then it's that climbing over the edge bit yeah. which is always the worst and yeah. I know we, those people who have done it you'll know that is to be the truth whether you've done it one or a hundred times it's still a little bit cagey as you're going over the back because yeah. you're relying on that one rope and that chap at the top but um yeah, yeah that's that's exactly it yes, but i mean you have got that fear of falling, which yeah, is yeah, yeah. natural so you know yeah, that, yeah. that builds in as well but i mean one of my mentors used to say to me look what you believe to be true is true for you and that means that you know that the work the perceived world around you is what you believe it to be and that means that you can change your beliefs you need to change your beliefs but it's not easy to change your beliefs but it is possible and if you don't believe that it's possible to change your beliefs then i've got two words for you which is santa claus and i will say no more on that <laughs> doesn't make me listening but um Another example, right? Terrorists in London, right? There are lots of them there, apparently. Apparently, so. Now, so this is this is kind of my beliefs on the potential for me being caught up in terrorism in London. So I went to London a couple of weeks ago for one day, and I was advised by a member of my family 
who shall remain nameless, but she knows who she is. <laughs> <laughs> I was told, I was advised by this member of my family not to go to London because, according to the mail, in the mail today it says, kind of giving away, terrorists <laughs> are going to do something in London. They're going to blow up tubes. They're going to plant bombs somewhere. They're going to drive a truck into crazy things. So, something's going to happen in London and you're going to get caught up in that. So I, I sort of did a bit of research and said, well, actually, there's on any given day in London, there's about 10 million people there. So the chances of me, one person, being caught up in an act of terrorism, me being the one in 10 million on one day in one area of London is pretty tiny. Mm. Now in my case, I am infinitely more likely to be hit by a London bus mm -hmm. than I am to be an, you know, a victim of terrorism. But it didn't say in the mail, there's a good chance that you might be hit by a London bus if you go to London. <laughs> yeah, I might suffer a heart attack or fall down an open manhole cover, but the daily mail don't report. 191 people were killed by coronary heart disease yesterday. Well, they were, but they didn't report on that. Um, government on car crash high alerts as fears that 2,000 people a year could die. Well, that is how many people a year die in car crashes, but that doesn't sell newspapers, does it? Mm -hmm. So I now take the stance that if it's in the newspapers, I don't need to worry about it because the sheer fact that the newspapers are printing it means that it's rare enough to be newsworthy. And the chances of it actually happening are so small. Um, I, mean, I was reading a quote yesterday from a guy who used to work in newspapers, and he said, "He said we were we were we were told to find the scariest thing we could find and write about it." He said every day was like Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if it's rare enough to be newsworthy, it's not going to happen, or it's not likely to happen to me. It's not actually likely to impact my life. So my beliefs are that it's stuff like heart disease or car crashes that they no longer bother to report. That's the stuff that's more likely to get me. But hey, I'm not reading about that. So that's all good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, Takes us back to episode one. Careful who you listen to. It is, definitely. Because who, who you <laughs> what listen papers to, you read. who you hang around with, that influences your beliefs. Um, one, one belief, not enough money. I haven't got enough money. I'm going to run out of money. Um, now we've been there, we've done that. Mm -hmm. It's not a good place to be making decisions from. Certainly not long-term decisions. Um, Short-term, yeah, you want to get out of that hole, but long-term, you end up making bad calls. And we always say, you get what you focus on. Focus on lack of money, no money, you'll get a lack of money. Once you realize that there's, there's an ocean full of money out there, and that old saying, you can go to the ocean with a teaspoon or a bucket, the ocean just doesn't care, but your decision-making improves from there, I think. Um, and I, I, I don't want to gloss over that too much because I know there's, a, there's probably some people out there listening who are going through that and think, well, that's easy for you to say or just make better decisions. But you know, how do you get away from that immediate worry of no money, no money? Um, for me, it's the same way that you get away from thinking about anything that might happen. Um, and it's a process that Tim Ferriss calls fear setting whereby you do or you live what you fear. So if you're worried that we're gonna have no money, um, I'm gonna end up living on Tesco value beans on Tesco value toast. Well, do that for a week. And then you kind of, after a week you'll be like, oh, well that's not actually that scary. It's like skydive. You know, oh my God, skydives are really, really hard. They're really scary. Go do one. And then afterwards, you'll think, oh, yeah, it wasn't actually that scary. Mm -hmm. You know, if I had to jump out of an airplane, yeah, I could do that, because I've done it. Once you've lived on Tesco Valley beans on Tesco Valley toast for a week, or rice and beans, or, or whatever it is, you know, whatever you fear, living in a bed sit or whatever, once you've done it, it's like, actually, is that the worst that can happen? Is that what I was worried about? And there's lots of people living the dream. You know, lots of people live in these fears that you have kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and if it's working out for lots of other people, then it's not going to be bad for you. No. Lots of people you, jump out of planes. And yes. Well, they survive. You would realise, I think, <laughs> if you did it for a week, mm. you would realise, it's, A, it's not as bad as you made it out to be, and B, you would survive. You'd say, oh, actually, 
I would still have food in my belly, I'd still have a roof over my head, and I could survive and I could get through this. And I can always get back to where I was. You know, by always trying stuff, you can always get back to where you were. Um, the last thing we talked about is environment. Now again, go back and listen to episode one. We talked a lot in there about, be careful who you listen to, the environment you surround yourself with. But if the people around you are fear mongers, if they're, they've got a problem for every solution, you've got to get away from them. You know, some people have got, um, some people believe that every silver lining has a cloud. Um, these are not the sort of people you want to be hanging around with. Um, speaking about hanging around, what do people think about me? That's another thing that people are worried about. It's a not, again, it's not a fear you're born with, it's conditioned from years of parenting. Well, parenting and schools and then, you know, you're, oh, actually I've got to live, you know, I've got to have the latest pair of trainers or I've got to do this and I've got to follow my peers and I've got to be, you know, every kind of creates yeah. that, doesn't they? So again, from childhood, really, yeah. you're kind of, you're falling into that, what do people think about me? Yeah, what would your teacher think if she knew you were doing that right now? Oh, I have <laughs> <laughs> You don't want Mrs. So-and-so thinking you're a naughty child, do you? Mm. You know, oh, come on, you've got to make sure your, your shirt's clean because, you know, you want your classmates to laugh at you. We, as parents as teachers we ingrain this in our children mm. and that's just compounded I think once particularly once you get to like senior school with teachers and bullies and then when you enter the workplace then mm. <laughs> the office politics that go with that I mean you know, not all workplaces are like that thankfully but certainly the civil service was that was rife with teachers and bullies and other people that were concerned about what other people thought about them you know it was their only concern that doing a good job didn't come into it, it was just like am I popular mm -hmm. um, do you find now, I mean, I, I've already turned the 40 step, but you're, you're about to. Um, do you think, kind of, actually, in your 40s, that you, I don't find that I worry too much about what other people have to say about me anymore? I've kind of, like, actually, I'm me, I've made myself, yeah. I've, I've, got my, I've got to where I've got to, and I've done very well, thanks very much. Yeah. And, um, and I don't really need to know or we need to worry about what other people think. Yeah, I, I, I literally came across a quote the other day. It said, at age 20, we worry about what others think of us. At age 40, we stop caring what they think. And at age 60, we discovered they haven't even been thinking about us at all. <laughs> <laughs> and anybody who knows somebody who goes past the 60 age, they just don't care what they say. No, they have no. got no idea or whatever. They just don't really care. It just comes out. Yeah. And it and, uh, then makes then them it, funny. But, but then they just start repeating the Daily Mail ad nauseum. You know, don't go to London, it's full of terrorists. <laughs> oh my God, no. um, the only person you need to be concerned with their opinion of you is yourself. No one else matters. Their opinion of you certainly doesn't. If they're going to... If they're, they're going to think it or say it, they're going to do that. But you are in control. You're in complete control of whether you react to that. Um, yeah, so what, what you think of yourself is much more important than what other people think of you. A good way to think of that, think more of yourself, is to grow your comfort zone, to make that hula hoop as big as you can. The bigger your comfort zone is, the bigger that hula hoop, the more you're going to think of yourself, the more your self-worth is going to be. Um, I talked earlier about going first, and this is a mantra that I try and live by now. I heard it a couple of years ago from a, a, it was a big wave surfer, and she talked about making quick decisions. Go first. Um, she was saying that like, if you meet someone in the street and you'd like to get a smile out of them, go first, smile first. If you want to have a conversation with someone in the sauna, go first, open up that conversation. Um, and for me, this was an example of one of my, not, not fears, but insecurities is when you go to a public event and they say, right, any questions? I never want to be the guy putting my hand up and asking the questions. Like, well, actually, sometimes I do. So I went to this event a few weeks ago and I thought, I'm, I've got a question for the speakers. Oh, I, really, I want to ask my question. So in my head, whilst the speaker's talking, I know he's going to ask the questions at the end. I'm thinking, right, I've got to go first. Because if I don't go first, I'm going to spend all that time whilst other people are asking their questions. I'm going to sit there thinking, is someone else going to ask my question? Oh, actually, that was a better question than mine. How am I going to word my question without sounding like a complete idiot? Oh, I'm like, no, this is a stupid question. I'm going to talk myself out of asking that question. So literally, the guy says, right, any question, boom, my hand was straight up. And I was like, right, yeah. Obviously, there was a few other people. I was like, eye contact, me, yeah, microphone. Thank you very much. I'm asking my question. Fantastic. I did it. I went first. I got it out of the way. And I went, then, after I've asked my question and it's been answered, and I've got an answer. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. That was really helpful. 
my adrenaline's flowing because I've had a little bit of fear, I've gone over that threshold, my hula hoop is a little bit bigger, but then also now I, I can relax because I can listen to other people's questions and I'm not thinking, that was a better question than mine. Oh, they worded their question a little bit better than I did. I'm just there thinking, oh yeah, that's an interesting question. Hmm, I must make a note about that answer. Not worrying about my question at all. Um, I guess about 95%, 99% of people don't go first. No. <laughs> if you ask for a volunteer, they never put a hand up no. because nobody wants to be that first person. Yeah. So you get your question answered, which is a yeah. So I'm now trying to be that because I'm, you know, someone now says when you volunteer, I'm pretty much almost the first there. If I go to a training course, I now try and sit in the front row, which I used to sit in the back row because then I wouldn't make eye contact, I wouldn't be picked on, I wouldn't be called to put my hand up. So much of this, I'm sure comes from school mm. and not wanting to put your hand up and give an answer in case it's wrong. And that I think is the probably the key driver in conditioning this habit is, you know, I've gone through what, 16 years of education whereby if you put your hand up and you get it wrong, your classmates go, ah, you don't know what you're talking about, oh, you bloody idiot. <laughs> or teacher's pet because you know, yeah, or, yeah, or you put your hand up for <laughs> so you sit at the back of the room mess around you know I think uh, one of the or two of the other uh, or two I think we had two questions asking about hiring of staff and then we talked about firing a bit just now and I know we've yeah, 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 a yeah. separate thing but for those that are kind of like one person at the moment and they're they're doing really well um, but they're not sure whether they can take on somebody to help them out um, that would that's the kind of question I think they were kind of asking about the hiring of staff and we had a fear of hiring from about 2006 when we had monetary issues and we had to lay off pretty much half our staff in one day, shut down two offices. Um, we kind of didn't hire anyone for seven years. That's it, I'm not doing it again is what yeah, you said. I'm we never ever going to hire anybody yeah. again. Uh, um, yeah, we, we had some outsourced sort of third parties that we took on, but in terms of actual, um, you know, staff on the payroll no we we resisted it I and mean, we had people literally begging to work for us and our answer to that was no no we don't we don't hire people you know we don't employ people mm. um but that held us back and eventually say 2013 i was persuaded to hire someone you know literally <laughs> he'd done some outsourced work for us and begged and said look i need a job you know uh, i want to work with you guys look, and we literally laid it down and said, look, if it doesn't work out, th this is what we're going to do. We're going to give it six months. If it doesn't work out, we're going to have to let you go. We're going to have to do this, you know, X, Y, Z. And he accepted that because he really, really wanted to work for us. And we accepted it because, okay, well, let's give it a go. Well, he hit the ground running and, you know, we've hired five people since then. Two of them are no longer with us. But we've probably doubled our business over that period thanks to actually hiring staff. I mean, there are... There are good staff and there are bad staff. And you have to kiss a few frogs. So as I say, we've let two people go out of the, you know, so out of the five we hired, two are no longer with us. Mm -hmm. um, and because they just didn't fit in. So the, the danger there is, well, what if I get another one that's rubbish? Well, then you let them go. <laughs> you don't hang around. So you're not committing to you know twenty thousand pounds a year salary or no. fifteen thousand pounds a year salary. You're not committing to that, are you really? No, you're, you're committing to what? Three months wages, I would say, because three months you know whether someone is going to work out or not. What's the actual risk? You know, if it doesn't work out, again, this is the, the kind of fear stuff thing. What's it going to take to get back to where you are now? Well, actually, if you're taking on someone like 18 grand a year, you're actually risking 1500 quid in month one, 1500 quid in month two, and 1500 quid in, in month three. So you're risking four and a half grand payable over three months in arrears. Um, taxes payable the month after that as well. I mean, if it's a sales role, your lay is even less because they should be bringing in sales. I would say probably covering their costs by the end of month two. And by month three, they should be in profit. And if they're not, they're a sales member staff. So why are they not making money after three months? Either there's something wrong with the product, something wrong with the system, or there's something wrong with the person. Um, and you're able to just let go. I say we will do an entire episode, I think, devoted to staff in the next few weeks because I think that is just a, a whole hot potato that we could just spend literally a whole hour talking about that anyway. Just watching our time actually, yes. Yeah. Moving on. <laughs> but whatever your fear is, like, unless it's falling or loud noises, you can train yourself to lose that fear or at least muffle it, you know, make it a little less noisy 
by getting out of that hula hoop and just making your comfort zone bigger. Um, the only exception to that is um, Carl Pilkington. Are you familiar with Carl Pilkington? Yeah. Ricky Gervais's mate. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Moaning of life. And Moaning of life. That's idiot abroad. Um, idiot abroad, that's what I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I think he was what. He did a, a TV series, I'm sure it was The Moaning of Life, where it, it was all about pushing him outside of his comfort zone. And for those who don't know Carl Pilkington, he's a dour mank. Who. He, he is one of these people who really yeah does see that every silver lining has a cloud you know he's, he sees the worst in everything and i remember one of the producers was saying to him but you know carl look we're, what all we're doing here is you know, growing your comfort zone when we're doing stuff which is designed to just make your comfort zone a little bit bigger and he was he went back to his hotel room and said well what if I really want? What if what I really want out of life, though, is to be comfortable, to spend all day lounging around in the comfort zone? Ah, oh, you've got to admit the comfort zone. That sounds like a bloody brilliant place to live, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so unless you're Carl Pilkington mm-hmm. and you're completely happy living in your comfort zone, you need to expand it, and you know. He wouldn't, he wouldn't have got that gig though if he was lounging around in his uh, comfort zone. He would not, no. <laughs> he wouldn't have been doing the other one either. I mean, I'm sure it's a bloody brilliant place to do. And another bloody brilliant place to be is right here next week when we'll, we'll be back with another episode of the podcast, episode 11. But before we do that, I'm going to tentatively ask the question Jason, do you have a tool of the week for us? Well, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> We're kind of crowdsourcing this one a little bit. Um, I'm going to go for zero this this time. It's accounting software. Bearing in mind, as you say, in the UK, it's uh, self-assessment deadline looming tomorrow. Um, if you have if you've already kind of not bothered this year, then get your asses in gear. But uh, from the day after on Wednesday, when we put this podcast live out, then perhaps you might want to take a look at zero.com. Uh, it's accounting software for small businesses. Um, it's where you can put monitor with your apps, uh, with all your apps on your phones and iPads. You can put all your invoicing in there and send them out from there. It keeps all of the receipts that you have come in. You can take photographs of those and that goes within it as well. And at the end of the year, it's a one button press to get your HMRC reports that you need for your self-assessment. So uh, zero.com is my tool of the week, I think. Very good. And I'll spell that for you, shall I? Uh, well, do you like to spell that? Yeah, that's <laughs> probably good. It would be handy. This is where I was going to crowdsource it too. Yeah, that's very good. <laughs> it's X-E-R-O, which is exactly how you'd expect as well as zero, isn't it? I think zero.com was taken, so they've gone for the X E R X E R O yeah. yeah. Uh, actually I'm gonna I'm gonna chip in with a resource of my own here. Yeah, because yes. um, we use uh, something called Receipt Bank, uh, which is an app where literally you take uh, photos of your receipts and then it somehow talks to Zero or Sage or whichever cloud based accounting software you're doing, it reconciles everything with your accounts. Um, I don't quite know how it works. All I know is my accountant said to me uh, get this receipt bank app, take photos of your receipts, and then you can just shred them. I'm like, okay, I like that. I like the idea of not having to just um, sort of manually deliver that carrier bag full of receipts, which I remember my dad having. Um, he used to meet with an accountant, I think, every six months. And I just remember having this, he just empty this carrier bag full of receipts on the table. <laughs> and the accountant would get this look on his face like, oh, I'm going to have any money today, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, receipt bank just kind of, yeah, automatically talks to zero, it talks to Sage. Um, reconciles everything. It just makes your life a lot easier because you haven't got receipts lying around everywhere. Um, no idea how it works, but yeah, there we go. That's that's our tool, two tools. tools. <laughs> oh, this week. So yeah, um, as always, guys, don't forget um, to join our Facebook community where you can comment on this episode. You can watch live recordings every Monday lunchtime, and that is at bigidea.co.uk forward slash Facebook. And the show notes are also on the website. Uh, what's the web address like? That's bigidea.co.uk forward slash podcast. And then you'll see all of our podcasts, all of our videos that we've recorded on Facebook. Uh, you can also get the audios through either iTunes or through Stitcher or through any of the other platforms that's all listed again on our website. Good. And if you've enjoyed these and you're on iTunes, don't forget to please leave us a nice iTunes review. We do appreciate them. We read every single one of them. We do. And uh, other than that, we will see you next week. When we're talking about... Uh, we're talking about next week's subject is am I in the right business so it's a comment a question we've had from several people who've ended up 
doing a particular type of business, uh, either because they've been made redundant and carried on doing what they were doing, or they've inherited a business, like a family business, or they've married into a business, and they're not sure if it's what they want to be doing. So if that, if that sounds like your business, your life in any way, then yeah. Listen, I'm, I'm good at cake, baking cakes, so I started baking some cakes, and yeah. <laughs> and that's kind of turned into a business. But you know, <laughs> yeah, is it what I need to be doing in my life? Yeah, is yeah. it my big why? So yeah, we'll be we'll be covering that on the next week's episode. Thank you, John. You're very welcome. I'll have you back you. again this week. <laughs> uh, you've, you've not been too bad. I think you can probably come back next week. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and hopefully you'll come back next week too. We will. Uh, we'll see you then. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> oh dear, fifty three minutes again. Oh, we didn't quite get it down to uh, half an hour, but there we are. We'll do eventually. I've lost the bloody group now. Where is it? <laughs> there it is. Ba -ba. So how did we find that, guys? Was that interesting for you guys? Do we answer some of your questions about your fears? Okay, so let's have a look. So, as we said, guys, we didn't see the comments during the live recording. So, Sharon, that is an age thing. What's an age thing? <laughs> uh, what part were we on there yes <laughs> not worrying about what we're saying I think that's that's the age thing that she might be referring to uh, she kind of get older you, you start not worrying uh, about what you're saying so she's, she's approaching the age 60 thing though, so yeah that's what yeah that so she knows not to care about what she says <laughs> <laughs> sorry Sharon <laughs> uh, so Jason Dale not sure if it's not sure it's don't hang around with certain people it's developing the confidence to listening to everyone and making an informed opinion that suits you I just find the dump people attitude is a bit too simplistic. It's kind of saying, you don't have my view, I don't like you. Um, kind of. I think you, you've got to have a choice eventually, because some people are just time vampires, and they will just suck the life out of you if you let them. And it's not necessarily dumping people, but it's rationing the time you spend with them. I think they don't they'll be careful of who you listen to. It's when you start listening to those people who are running things down and moaning all the time and are, are, are kind of putting you down, that's when it becomes an issue. And, that not, and when you say don't dump, it's kind of like actually be careful who you're listening to. You know, you can dump some of the people that you know that, that you wouldn't want to listen to, you know, yeah. for business or for personal life now. Well, I'd say you yeah. couldn't dump them. But no, it's a perfect <laughs> example. Is is you know, mother-in-law? You know, mm -hmm. she rants on about the Daily Mail, and you know, it's, I don't listen to her now. Um, but that's not to say I don't want to hang around with her. It's not a, I don't spend any time with her. It's a case of, you know, chances of asking for stuff. No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure if you round it up, it is, isn't it? Pretty much 60, isn't it? I think you might be right, yeah. <laughs> not too far. Um, but yeah, it's, it's kind of one of those things, Jace, where I think yeah, it's not about dumping people. It's about spending less time with those who drain you and more time with those who inspire you. And certainly... You know, online you can surround yourself with whoever you want and with Facebook you can dump people there's people who I'm friends with on Facebook who I've hidden their posts so I never see their posts because all they do is moan and bitch and whine all the time it's like actually I don't want to hang around with these people and then there's other people who I barely know who actually I will put their feet you know put their posts first in my news feed because actually I like their attitude I like their their enthusiasm I like their Guile. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, that was good. I, I enjoyed that one. Um, so next week, I said we're going to be talking about whether you're in the right business, which I think is a really, really interesting one. It's a comment we've had from a several, several of our sort of private clients recently, hasn't it? Mm -hmm. In terms of, well, I've been doing this for twenty years. I've been doing this for thirty years. I don't quite know why I'm still doing it. Yeah. Um, so I think that that could be an interesting one. So it's those who fall into it. I think that's the that's the. Yeah, yeah. that's the biggest category of, of those in the am I in the right business it's just those that fall into it yeah. oh, I tried this once and then I worked out so I've kind of turned that into a business but <laughs> is it something I can do for the rest of my life I don't know yeah yeah. so yeah that, that's what we'll be covering next week so as always guys keep the comments coming we will answer any that we we haven't answered already uh, we will pick them up throughout the week um, don't forget also you can add people into this group so go up to the top of the page and click Add, add members it says so you just type the name in where it says add members and then they'll be in the group too and they can see the podcast too good and with that we will uh, we'll see you next week bye bye thank you everyone take care bye bye producer boy Bob isn't pushing the button